A good Wednesday to you. Welcome to another of our uh, midweek broadcasts and our, our study uh, of the wisdom books. And uh, I was looking through some facts and figures from the year that sort of um, amazed me this week um, for the family here at at Lancaster, you know, we stopped meeting on a regular basis on oh, the first um, regular meeting we missed was March 15th. It's been that long, 15th, 15th of March. And then we went 10 weeks like that. And then we started the uh, parking lot services on Sunday morning on May 24th and we've been doing that for about seven weeks so from the beginning of this weird period of 2020 uh, to now is about 17 weeks we're 17 weeks into this by the end of July we'll be 20 weeks in so it's uh, certainly been um, a year to remember in one sense and a year to forget and uh, but uh, we're, we're plowing through it and hopefully we're continuing to grow and uh, I'm enjoying uh, teaching in this in this setting I hope you're getting stuff from it we're uh, again in the study called the quest for wisdom uh, we began it by uh, sort of setting the stage for some of what we call the wisdom books of the Bible especially in the Old Testament although we'll also be uh, looking at some New Testament things uh, but after um, setting the stage for a couple of sessions then we began last time getting into one of the books the first one uh, the book of Job and uh, introduced Job and began into the first part of the text of Job Job's a long book 42 chapters so we're not going to go through it uh, in detail verse by verse um, but we're going to look at sort of the beginning and the end and then a summary of the middle and uh, try and get what we can, uh, the main thrust of the book and that kind of thing and, and help us make sure that we read it well and in the way it was intended. Uh, so just looking back a little bit on, on what we saw the first time, uh, as Job opens, of course, he, you have this section uh, story type section what we call prose non-poetry most of the book is poetry but Job begins uh, with a description of him as the greatest man in the east he's from this unknown land at least unknown to us called Uz and seems to be uh, a patriarch or at least he's behaving like a patriarch he's leading his family's worship, offering sacrifices to them, and so forth. He seems wealthy and respected and righteous and all those good things. And um, this, is, this is how his story opens. And then we have this mysterious behind-the-scenes look at what's going on up in the throne room of God. God... Uh, in his divine court receives uh, people, visitors, they're called the sons of God, and among uh, those who present themselves before him is one called the Satan. Uh, we might also translate that the adversary. And um, God engages Satan in conversation and brings up Job. Job, um, his, his great servant Job, ask Satan if he's noticed him and that kind of thing and um, and um, Satan says well yeah he he's a great guy uh, of course he serves you Lord you've done everything to bless him and you've completely protected him if you took away his protection then he would curse you and uh, we have this verse again in chapter 1, verse 9, which we suggested might be one of, if not the central theme of the book, where Satan asks God, does Job fear God for no reason? 
That is, if you took some of the blessings away, would he still serve you? And so we have this question being considered in Job, will a person serve God uh, come what may? And that's at least one of the major thrusts of the book. So that gets us to uh, the next little story section here, um, chapter 1, verses 13 through 22, where we get into uh, the bad things that come Job's way. And just want to read this paragraph and reflect on it for a moment with you. Job chapter 1, verse 13, Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans... Uh, a group of people, a nationality. The Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest, bro oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. So we see the suffering of Job sort of coming at him in great waves, one after the other, and he loses everything that had been listed in the opening verses of chapter 1, as his uh, great blessings. You know, he loses his riches. He loses, tragically, his children. And um, almost an unimaginable cascade of, of destruction in Job's life. And then almost as strangely, at least to us, seems Job's reaction uh, the first thing that's mentioned is that he falls down in worship. Uh, probably shouldn't think of this, that he was singing Devo songs, uh, but he, he bows in prayer, sort of face to the earth is the thrust of the language. Uh, he, he demonstrates his faith, he, he blesses God, and um, we, we won't expect this to continue. As you continue to read Job, you'll see that he doesn't take all this suffering laying down. He's going to have some things to say about it. Uh, but we're reminded here of the greatness of Job. We're reminded that he believed in a good and, and loving God. And even though all this awful stuff has happened to him in quick succession, he demonstrates his, his faith. You know, some people uh, leave God at the first symptom of suffering because I guess they, they didn't expect much else from God in the first place. Either they had no faith at all or very little 
Uh, but Job, he did expect better because he believed God was good. And, and so we'll see how this all plays out. Uh, one of the things that happens in the course of the story of Job is that the God, he, he finds out that the God that he thought he knew um, was different than the real God of the universe. And, and for all of us, that's a key point in life. When we discover, and we all do to some degree, uh, that God is not necessarily uh, the God we thought we knew that some of the things that we assumed about him aren't correct. You know, uh, Job was greatly blessed. He was righteous. And he might have thought that that because he was close to God and good, uh, that he would always receive good. Uh, but he finds out that's not the case. And that's a key point in Job's life. Will he continue to serve God? Will he continue to believe and have faith? That's similar situation that we all face at times because as we learn of God uh, some of our preconceived notions or things we've always assumed uh, may fall to the wayside and will there be anything left of what we believe at that point that's a key question so uh, this is the beginning of what we normally think of in connection with Job his suffering and his response as, as chapter 2 opens, now we're back in the, uh, the throne room of God. So again, just to, to remind us, you know, that we had this scene in chapter 1 uh, where God speaks to Satan, and now we have this scene in chapter 2. And as far as we know, Job himself never knows about these interchanges between the God of the universe and the adversary. Uh, we know about them, the, the, the narrator of the story informs us, but Job doesn't. Uh, but it begins very similarly uh, to the first account of this. So uh, reading again at the beginning of chapter 2, it says, Again there was a day when the sons of God came in to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered and, and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. Again, this sounds very much like the first account. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without, without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. Um, God once again brings Job up to, to Satan and uh, confronts Satan about him. and says, uh, you see, he still serves me. And, and, and Satan responds in kind. In fact, he asks for more privilege to attack Job more leeway with Job in order to prove his point. So it's almost like we have this great debate going on in the throne room of heaven between God and Satan over Job and his life. Uh, as, we, as we've talked about, the book of Job is a lengthy wisdom debate between Job and his friends, but there's also this contest, we might call it, this debate going on in heaven between God and, and the great enemy of man, the adversary. And I, I always ask people when we study this, you know, how do you feel about this kind of thing going on in the throne room, throne room of heaven? And 
having effects on people's lives here on earth. Uh, is this only a one-time thing that just happened in the time of Job? Or is, has Satan continued um, as the adversary and the opponent of God's people and challenging God and so forth? Or, honestly, is God still bringing up our name to the tempter? And uh, how do you feel about that? Um, again, we don't think that Job knew about this. And we certainly don't know what's going on in the throne room of heaven. It's a fascinating thing to think about. And uh, it's faith stretching, let's say. And so in the next little section, verses 7 through 10 of chapter 2, we begin to get some insight into what made Job so special. So continuing on, it says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job, with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And one of the things that this book does, the book of Job, is it confronts sort of the conventional wisdom of the world about why people suffer. What is the conventional wisdom in the ancient world and probably to a great degree still today? The conventional wisdom as to why bad things happen is due to the, the bad acts of people. That is due to people's sin. They suffer because they've done something wrong. They've sinned. And in, in Job, in contrast, you know, Job, he suffers. No, no one questions that. He suffers greatly. But he is presented throughout the book as a righteous sufferer. Um, that is very important to remember as we read the rest of the wisdom books. Okay. So we keep in mind this point in Job, that there is such a thing as a righteous sufferer. Sometimes, in God's world, bad things happen to good people. And it can't be explained by the sin of the sufferer. Job is a righteous sufferer. Now, elsewhere in the wisdom books, a lot of times, book of Proverbs, for instance, there are a lot of Proverbs that make the generally true point that if you do good, good things happen. But we know that's not always the case. And part of wisdom is figuring that out. Job was a good person, a righteous man, the greatest man in his part of the world, greatest man in the East, and yet who suffered more than Job? So, uh, that, that's an important thing to remember. And again, here in this little section that we just read, you know, we talked about the theme, verse, verse 9, but also, um, uh, verse 9 of chapter 1, but uh, also here in verse 10, uh, Job in response to his wife, and his wife comes at him doing what Satan had said Job would do if God allowed bad things to happen to him, that he would curse God. Well, Job's wife encourages him to do that very thing. And, and, and he says, shall we receive good from, from God and shall we not receive evil? Um, that's one of the great statements of the book and, and takeaways, uh, that there is both good things and bad things that happen in this world to all people to good people and to bad people. Uh, so another thing to file away to make sure we understand what's going on in these books. 
In the next few verses of chapter 2, as the, as the second chapter closes, uh, we get um, more of the characters of the book showing up. So we have the introduction of Job's friends. It begins in verse 11. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Naamathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. So we have the three friends uh, that will uh, make these speeches in the bulk of the book. Um, they show up, uh, they, they make arrangements to come together to, to uh, comfort and, and show sympathy to their friend Job. And here's one of the interesting parts of the story. That is, that the very best things that the friends did for Job, they do here right at the very beginning. And that is that they sit with him in silence for a period of, of seven days. Seven days and seven nights, a full week. Job's friends just sit there and don't say anything. This is the best thing they do for him uh, in the entire story. Um, they don't do anything bad until they open their mouth, beginning in chapter 4. And that's when they get in trouble. Uh, a very practical point from Job, because one of the hardest things, I think, in life is when we see someone that we care about, a friend, a loved one, suffering, um, a lot of times we struggle with, what do we say? Uh, especially something like this where a person loses loved ones, their family, uh, let alone their riches and, and way of life and all those things. But, but then to lose all your children, uh, what do you say to a person in a, in a situation like that? Sometimes we shy away from them because we don't know what to say. That's a very common uh, predicament that we find ourselves in. I think it's always good to remember that jo the greatest thing Job's friends did was to come and be with him and just be there and not say anything. They didn't mess up until they started speaking. All you have to do is show up and sit with someone. Likely, they're not going to remember anything you say uh, after the suffering's over and after they've come out of the period of uh, tumult and tragedy in their life. They're not going to remember the words you said, but they will never forget the fact that you were there. But if you open your mouth too much and you say some of the kinds of things that Job's friends said, they accused him uh, of of having done something wrong. And Job, why don't you go just tell us what you did so we can fix this. Oh, you can guarantee Job remembered that. Uh, sometimes saying something, saying the wrong thing can be memorable and do a lot of damage. But just coming and being with the sufferer is probably the best thing we can do. Keep that in mind. You don't have to say anything. So that gets us through uh, the opening two chapters of the book. Um, and remember that after this, chapters 3 through 42, for the most part, you have this long debate between Job and his friends, and then God comes in at the end and speaks. And that all begins with Job's lament in chapter 3, his cursing of the day he was born. We'll just notice a couple of verses of that here in a minute. Uh, but... 
you know, in, in these chapters, the friends and Job are going to go back and forth debating about what happened to Job and why. And Job has his view, they have theirs, and then God has his in the end. Um, but one thing I like to do when I'm teaching Job is to cover all the, the uh, non-poetry parts of the book, the prose sections, first, and then come back to the middle. Um, and so I want us to, to jump to the end of the book, um, all the way to chapter 42. So we're skipping the bulk here for now. And just notice how the book ends. So we've had this introduction and the interchange between God and Satan and the suffering of Job described. Now we're going to, then, then it goes through all the debates between Job and his friends. We're going to skip and see what happens at the end of the story. It's not a typical way we tell stories. Uh, but one thing we find out with this kind of literature it, the literature of the ancient world, the literature of the East, as opposed to where we live in the West, a lot of times it's understood out of order. Uh, and and so I, sometimes I like to teach it like that. So skipping all the way to the end of the book, uh, chapter 42, let's just notice how this all wraps up. Beginning at verse 7, chapter 42. And remember, at the end of the long cycle of debates, God speaks um, and gives his uh, explanation of things and so forth, his correction of things. And so that's why it says in verse 7, after the Lord had spoken these words to, to Job, then the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. So we have this rebuke of the three friends where God says, You have not spoken right of me pretty much judges everything they had said. They had, had not said what was true or right of God, but that Job had. This is God's judgment on what has taken place in the long middle section of the book. And, and then God gives his prescription to fix this situation. What is it? Offer burnt offerings and have Job pray for you a great humbling of these friends who thought they had it all figured out. You have sinned, God says, and you need to, to make amends, you need to offer burnt offerings, and have Job pray intercessory prayer on your behalf. Uh, he calls what they had said folly, that is foolishness, um, the opposite of wisdom is what they had spoken really important to remember that when we're reading what they say, even some of the things they say which sound right, God in the end judges it as foolishness. And, um, and yet Job uh, does intercede for these friends. He prays for them and rescues them from judgment in essence. Um, so again, we see one of the reasons that Job is great. Um, these miserable comforters, as they're called, uh, Job's friends, are forgiven in the end, both by Job and by God. Then the last section, paragraph of the book, verses 10 and following, it says this, And the Lord 
restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in this house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapuk. And in all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this Job lived 140 years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. So we have the restoration of Job here, that is, uh, the giving back of all he had lost. He is made twice as rich as, as he was at the first. Uh, if you look back at the numbers from chapter 1 of all his sheep and oxen and donkeys and so forth, they're exactly doubled here at the end of the story. Um, and he's given back the same amount of children as he had before, seven sons, three daughters. And then in addition to that, many, many grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so forth. And so um, all these things are, are given back and, and, and more to Job. Again, we have this statement, which we saw at the beginning. Uh, here it's in verse 11 of chapter 42. Who is it that brought the evil upon Job? Well, verse 11 does not say the Satan did it. It says the Lord. The Lord brought the evil. Now, sometimes people are concerned about that. They say, I didn't think God did evil. One thing we have to keep in mind, uh, we're not necessarily, when we see the word evil, we're not necessarily talking about moral evil. That is wickedness. Um, the word evil can be translated bad. Um, it's the idea of negative instead of positive, that kind of thing. Uh, it can be translated uh, sometimes evil, uh, but also misery, distress, injury, bad. Um, and so sometimes God does allow bad to come into the life of even righteous people, even his servants. Um, but we shouldn't think of it in the sense of what a lot of times we think of when we hear the word evil, just, just bad stuff. Uh, but it is attributed to the Lord in verse 11 rather than, than just to Satan. Yeah. I think it's interesting also that we get the names of the three new daughters that Job has. Um, we didn't get, we don't get the names of the brothers. Uh, we didn't get the names of any of the ten children at the beginning of the story. But here we get the names of three of the daughters. Uh, a lot of times, you know, women themselves go unnamed in especially the Old Testament, but also the New. Uh, and remember that Job's wife is not named. But here we get the names of the three daughters. I wonder why. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. I, I like the suggestion that this seems to argue against the idea that this is just a made-up story, a, a fairy tale, or even a parable. Um, the, the narrator, the author of Job, writes as if he wants us to understand that these were real people. Uh, so we have Job, and uh, you know we have the, the friends who are named. Bildad, Zophar, uh, Elihu, and so forth. And here we have these daughters, Jemima, uh, Keziah, Karen, Hapuk, um, named at the end. 
could it be that part of the thrust of this is to, to make us understand that this is real stuff that happened at some point, although we don't know when exactly? Possibly. Uh, but we do get the names of these daughters and their praise. They're the most beautiful women in the world, that kind of thing. Um, almost sounds like Job wrote it, right? That the dad wrote. Uh, but again, uh, also we have the detail of, of Job's age. So after all the events of the book, however, Job, however old Job was at the beginning, he lives after that 140 years. And so uh, we can easily imagine Imagine a man 200 plus years old, and that would put him in a pretty ancient setting. So the chapters 1 and 2, and then these few verses at the end of chapter 42, um, are all the uh, prose section, the sto story section of the book of Job, and then uh, again, all the wisdom debate, the poetry in the middle. And uh, we'll get into a little bit of a survey of that in our next session. Um, what we're going to find in, in chapters 4 through 27 are three cycles of speeches. Um, so remember, Job has three friends that show up, and, and one of the friends will speak, and then Job will reply and then the next friend will speak, and then Job will reply, and so on and so forth through all these chapters. And all of that is preceded by this lament of Job in chapter 3, where he curses the day he was born. Um, chapter 3 is fascinating. It's sort of Job's blues masterpiece, we might say. But he's really, you know, all this terrible tragedy has come upon him. He's responding to that with lament. That is a cry, a heart cry to God. You know, why did you even let me be born if all this was going to happen to me? It, it starts chapter three, verse three, let the day perish on which I was born and the night that said a man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. And it goes on like that throughout, uh, sort of lengthy chapter three. Um, one of the things we find sometimes in the wisdom books is lament. Um, but there's a lot of lament in the book of Psalms. It's interesting, isn't it, that in our song books, in our, our uh, worship literature today, we don't find lament. Uh, if it's there, I'm not aware of it, and it's certainly not popular in, in modern worship music. Um, what is popular is, is, is praise and, um, and, and worshipful, joyful uh, kinds of songs, and, and we all love that, but there's not lament, and yet the Bible is rich with lament, and I wonder if that says something about us. Uh, Something that we lack in, in our religious culture uh, in the church these days when terrible things happen. A uh, good part of our struggle through this pandemic and, um, and some of the other things that have been happening in our world be that we have no language, spiritual language, to express it with before our God. We need uh, gifted uh, worship composers and, and, and leaders to bring back lament, the language of suffering among us, because it's something we all experience, and, um, and yet you don't always have the words to keep us connected to God in those moments. Uh, but the biblical people certainly did. One an ex excellent example of lament uh, outside of the book of Job, um, go look at Psalm 137. Psalm 137 by the <coughs> begins, By the waters of Babylon, there I sat down and wept when I remembered Zion. And so you have this, this Jew 
in exile in in Babylon, and he's thinking of his homeland, and he's crying as he does so, and it's a song, you know, and uh, I just think we're poor because we don't have worship uh, lament today. It's something for us to think about and and maybe to develop uh, because it's certainly a part of life. Thank you for um, checking this session out. Uh, next time again, we'll go through, survey through the uh, middle of the book and, and then we'll be moving on to another one of the wisdom books after that. But hope you have a good um, midweek and that, um, that this has been a help in that. God bless you. We'll see you again soon.